and you're joining the Connection. Thank you, Janet. <laughs> um, you are participating today in the Connecting Scientists with Middle and High School Educators webinar series. Um, this webinar series is being brought to you by the Alaska Natural Resource and Outdoor Education Association in partnership with the Alaska Cooperative Extension Service, Project Learning Tree, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS. And in the chat box, you'll see ARCUS chatting. That's actually my chatting, um, Kathy Rezebeck. So let's see how many we have out there today. Uh, we had about 10 people sign up. We have um, Helen. Um, Helen is there. Helen, um, let me see here. Helen must be one of Kay Shoemaker's students. Ah, Helen, thank you. You called in. Um, and uh, go ahead. I'm hoping you have the slides that so you can look at the PDF version of the slides today. We'll remember that Helen is only on the phone. She is not connected to the internet. We have Kay Shoemaker, Miles Malkerson, our um, speaker today, Meg Burgess, Les Hall, Shannon Bird must be uh, one of Kay Shoemaker's students as well. And we have Sierra. Um, Sierra is uh, joining us from Anchorage. Shannon, I see that you, you are just on the phone, so we'll remember that too. So um, if, you do if you do have a PDF and you're only by phone, please bring that up and we'll make sure and let you know when to change slides. If you are connected by computer, um, we'll ask you please to mute your computer's audio connection. And you will not need to call in by telephone if you can hear me fine via your computer. The Alaska Natural Resource and Outdoor Education Association, or ANRO, is a statewide nonprofit, and each of you joined this organization uh, to get access to today's webinar. Um, the organization promotes and implements natural resource, outdoor, and environmental education for all Alaskans, and we collaborate with organizations, agencies, and school districts to provide education resources, training, and networking opportunities about Alaska's natural resources. I hope you take an opportunity to look at the website um, thoroughly and get acquainted with AMRO. This is the first in a webinar series of five. Uh, they're being held every two weeks, always on Wednesday afternoons at 4 o'clock. All the sessions will be recorded and archived, and I'll be sure and send you reminders each week that you have a webinar scheduled. Um, for those of you, and I believe there may be three of you taking this for credit, um, please stay after the presentation is over. Um, Meg Brigitte, who is today's speaker, is also the instructor for the credit course, and she'd like to speak briefly with you about how to get your credit. We are in Blackboard Collaborate, and it has a few features that we'll be using just, and I, I think we've learned about a few of them before we started today, but just to kind of quickly go through, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a video feed, and you'll also see, and we won't be using the video feed today. Um, you will also see a talk button. Only one person can talk at a time, except for me. And um, our speaking will be, speaker will be doing most of the talking. Um, but when you have a question, um, 
you can you can put it in the chat box during the presentation. Um, you'll see some icons below the um, the the hand icon under the Arcus moderators is the one icon that um, you may be using today. And if you want to raise your hand, particularly if you have a question, you punch that hand icon. I'll be watching the chat function carefully and the participants uh, list to see if you've raised your hand or you have a question in chat. You see a list of today's participants. And then under that is the chat box. We would like to hear your questions. And um, at the same time, we'd like to hear our speaker and the presentation. And so during the presentation, if you could please type your question in the chat box, and I will be monitoring it. Um, if, if I can, uh, if Meg uh, pauses briefly and we can ask the question during the presentation, we will do that. Um, but at the end of the presentation, we'll be sure and, and get all of your questions. Um, use that hand button. And the important thing is when I call on you, um, go ahead and press the talk button. You won't be able to be heard unless you press the talk button. And then as soon as you finish um, asking your question, um, you need to unclick the talk button so that Meg, our speaker, can then answer your question. So today's presentation is called, It's All About Trees, Tree Physiology. And Meg Burgett with the Cooperative Extension Service is today's speaker. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Meg. Uh, she'll let me know when to change the slide. And um, also, those of you who are on your PDF instead of the Internet, um, you may then change your slides at that time, too. So Meg, um, go right ahead. It's all yours. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you to all of you that have joined us today for our very first webinar for Anne Rose Science Seminar Series. For my part today, it was really hard to try and narrow down what we could cover. There is so much to choose from. So I think we'll start with some basics, focusing on the physiology of our trees, how and why they work the way they do, and I'm hoping that with a better understanding of these basic tree functions, you can build a fuller understanding and appreciation of the forest and their contributions to our local and global communities. OK? So um, first of all, Kathy asked that I introduce myself and let you know how I got to be where I am. Um, I am the Alaska Project, Project Learning Tree Coordinator. I work for the University of Alaska Cooperative Extension Service. I am a forester and I am an educator. I earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Forest Management in Texas. I went to school, like so many foresters, thinking that I would spend my days after school deep in the piney woods of East Texas where I wouldn't have to talk to anyone. Instead, I ended up in the forest of Alaska in front of crowds of people and talking to anyone that would listen. I began working with Extension Service shortly after arriving in Alaska in 1985. My first years were spent chasing bugs around the Matanuska Valley, working primarily with agricultural producers, home gardeners with a few tree questions thrown in occasionally. I began facilitating Project Learning Tree workshops in the early 1990s when Alaska's Division of Forestry managed the program. My position has changed many times with extension. I have worked with all kinds of audiences, young and old, and on a variety of natural resource topics, from fishing to farming. And even though it wasn't always forestry, having that degree opened doors and made things possible. 
Extension has been a good fit for me after all, thanks mostly to some awesome mentors along my way, and has been a place where I could share my passion for the natural world with others, which is what drew me into forestry in the first place. Kathy? Okay. So we're going to start today with a very quick overview of the forest of Alaska. There are over 129 million acres of forested lands in Alaska, stretching from the coastal areas of southeast Alaska to the southern slopes of the Brooks Range. And while the industry has shrunk considerably, forestry still provides around $21 million in revenue each year. Alaska's forests produce lumber, house logs, and increasingly significant in the past decade, fuel wood. Our forests also supply many non-timbered products such as syrup, medicinal plants, and mediums for a variety of arts and crafts. Next. Forests are classified by location and predominant tree species. In Alaska, we have two broad forest types. The boreal forest of the interior, which is the kind of light green area of the middle of the state. The coastal temperate rainforest of southeast Alaska, it's aqua blue color on the map here. And the region around Cook Inlet, uh, this map is lime green is often considered a transitional zone and displays characteristics of both forest types. Okay? Alaska's boreal forest is part of a much larger global biome found circumpolar in the northern hemisphere. The global boreal forest makes up 29% of the world's forest and plays a significant role in the planet's biodiversity and climate. Next. Okay, Alaska, in Alaska, the boreal forest is found throughout the interior, stretching down into Cook Lane Inlet around Anchorage and up to the, and up to the southern edge of the Brooks Range. Okay? Typically, the area, this forest area, has a short growing season with cold and snowy climates. Frozen ground in the northern region leads to perched water tables and soggy soils. It is also sparsely treed, earning the name taiga, a Russian word for land of little sticks. Permafrost is common in the southern regions with swampy areas mixed with drier, high ground, and well-drained stream beds. Fire plays an important role in the regeneration of these forests. Next. Oh, we've had a few people join by phone only, and we are on slide 13. Yeah, uh, for those of you that are following along with the PDF, just add five to each number. Okay. Uh, conifers dominate the boreal forest with black and white spruce found throughout the region. Eastern larch or tamarack is found in interior Alaska. Hardwoods of the boreal forest include poplar, cottonwood, aspen, and birch. Understory plants include prickly roses, high bush cranberries, and resin bark. The ground is often covered in low bush cranberries, mosses, and Labrador tea. Next. Alaska's coastal temperate rainforest stretches along Alaska's southeastern coast and is part of the Pacific Northwest forest. These types of forests, co uh, coastal rainforests, are rare, occurring in only a few places outside of Alaska. The region experiences cool summers, mild winters, and loads of precipitation. Large fires are rare. Okay? The vast majority of these forests are in old growth conditions. 
Young growth comes on newly exposed lands from landslides, receding glaciers, and beach upheaval. Secondary growth comes in areas felled by wind or cleared for harvest. Next. Conifers again dominate this forest, with western hemlock and Sitka spruce the most common and the most economically important species for Alaska. Other conifers include western red and Alaska yellow cedars. Hardwoods such as cottonwood and alder are found mostly in newly disturbed areas. Okay. Considered a transition zone, the Cook Inlet region of South Central Alaska shares characteristics with the two other forest types. The climate is mild and ground is generally free of permafrost. Forests in this region contain pure and mixed stands of conifers, black and white spruce, and hardwoods such as quaking aspen, balsam poplar, and birch. Next. Grasslands are common in all areas of this forest. You can also find western hemlock and Sitka spruce along the coast. And this is the only region of Alaska that you will find a hybrid cross of Sitka and white spruces, the Lux spruce. Next. So our forests are full of living organisms that all need the same basic elements to survive. Just like us, all living things require clean air to breathe, water to drink, nourishment, and shelter from the other elements. Plant or animal, these are basic requirements. Next. A tree, however, is constrained to one location, so it cannot go in search of all the elements it needs, like we can. So the tree requires an additional element that allows it to produce its nourishment from the elements that are available to it. The addition of sunlight, along with air, water, and essential minerals, enable the tree to produce the sugars that make tree growth possible and sustain it through the winters. Next. But before we go too far, what actually is a tree and what makes it different from other plants? The big difference is the woody stem. Otherwise, it has all the characteristics of any green plant. A forester defines a tree as a woody perennial, typically large and with a well-defined stem or stems that carries a more or less defined crown. Next. The structure of a tree is divided into three basic parts. The root system, a trunk or bowl, and a crown. Each part with its own components and functions. Next. The root system has four basic functions for the tree. First, it provides anchorage, holding the tree in the ground and keeping it upright. Roots store the energy reserves needed to sustain the tree and produce spring foliage. Roots absorb needed water, oxygen, and minerals. And the roots also conduct those elements to the rest of the tree for production of needed energy supplies and then transport those reserves back to the tree when needed. Next. The tree trunk or bowl supports the crown and gives shape to the tree. It also connects the leafy branches of the crown above to the root system below. The cells of the Hello? tree act much like Hello, yes? um, hold on one second. Mary, please. Uh, who has joined us? Yep. I'm only person. Are you calling by phone or are you on the internet? I'm calling my phone. Okay. Um, while you're listening, go ahead and mute your phone and um, follow along on uh, the PDF file if you have it. We're on slide 24. Okay. Your name, Thank you. your name once again, please. Emily. Emily. Welcome, Emily. 
Okay, um, did I answer your question, Russ? It's B O L E, not bowl, not a bowl. So it's another word for stem. So the tree trunk or bowl supports the crown and gives shape to the tree, connects the leafy branches of the crown above to the root system below. The cells of the tree act much like a superhighway. Their system of pipes carrying water, oxygen, and essential minerals up to the leaves and energy reserves as sugar down to the roots for future use. Okay? If we could peel back the layers of the trunk, what would we find there? Starting at the very center of the tree is the heartwood. This is the old wood, no longer alive, but filled with stored sugars, oils, and dyes. The heartwood provides support for the tree. Outside of the heartwood is the xylem, or the sapwood. This is the youngest layer of wood in the trunk. Xylem is made of thick wall cells called tracheids that carry water, oxygen, and essential nutrients from the roots to the leaves. As xylem tissue dies, it becomes part of the heartwood, continuing to support the tree. Right beyond the xylem is a very thin layer of cells that grow in both directions. It's the only part of the tree trunk that grows. It produces new xylem, new cambium cells, and swollen cells. This is called the vascular cambium. Right beyond the cambium is the phloem tissues, our inner bark. The phloem is another set of pipes that carry sugars produced in the leaves down the tree to the roots for storage. On the very outside is the bark. Bark is made up of dead and cast off phloem cells and serves as a suit of armor around the trees, providing protection from the weather, insects, and animals. Okay. The shape of the crown often identifies the tree. The crown provides many of the benefits we associate with trees, filtering dust from the air, providing shade, sheltering the soil from impact of rain, and returning oxygen to the atmosphere. Within the crown, we find the branches that stretch out as far and wide as possible to help the leaves reach sunlight. More branches allow the tree to have more leaves. The tips of the branches are also an area of growth, one of three places where a tree gets larger. Leaves are found in the crown, the workhorse of the tree. They contain the chlorophyll, that special element that allows the leaf to utilize the sun's energy to convert carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water and nutrients from the roots into sugars to nourish and sustain the tree. The crown is also where we find the sexual reproductive structures of the tree. Okay? With all of these parts and pieces, each one with its own job to do within the tree, there is a lot going on. The tree has four major life functions performed by these different parts. These functions include photosynthesis, respiration, transpiration, and absorption. Okay? Photosynthesis, it's what sets plants, producers, apart from other organisms, consumers. It is the process that permits trees to trap energy from the sun in the form of sugars that the tree then uses for immediate and potential growth. The word photosynthesis means putting together with light and refers to a manufacturing process that happens within the cells called chloroplasts located in the leaf of the tree. These chloroplast cells contain the chlorophyll, the green pigment that makes all this possible and gives trees their color. 
Water absorbed by the tree and carried from the roots comes in contact with the chlorophyll in the leaves. At the same time, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere enter the leaves through small holes on the underside of the leaf. When exposed to sunlight, a chemical reaction occurs that breaks down the water, carbon dioxide, and other elements and forms sugars and oxygen. The sugars are carried off to other parts of the tree for immediate use or storage, or for immediate use or storage for future growth. Oxygen is released to the atmosphere. <laughs> Sorry, I'm reading comments. Next, Kathy. Respiration is essentially the reversal of photosynthesis. But unlike photosynthesis, which happens only when the sun is out, respiration occurs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Next. Trees need energy to grow. This energy comes from the deconstruction of the sugars produced during photosynthesis. Reproduction occurs in the mitochondria of the tree cells where sugar is combined with oxygen from the atmosphere and, the, and reaction releases energy, carbon dioxide, and water. Next. Transpiration and absorption go hand in hand. Water absorbed by the roots is pulled through the tree by the loss of water vapor through small openings in the underside of the leaves called stomata. Stomata have the ability to open and close, regulating cooling of the tree and turgor or rigidity in the leaves. Transpiration is how minerals from the soil reach the leaves for photosynthesis. Next. The tree growth, tree growth occurs in specialized tissues within the tree called meristem. These tissues are found in three locations in the tree, at branch tips, root tips, and in the cambium layer of the tree trunk. Next. Each year, trees experience primary growth as apical meristem in the terminal and auxiliary buds lengthen twigs and produce leaves and flowers. Secondary growth widens the stem in diameter as meristem tissues in the cambium layer add xylem and phloem cells, all fueled by the energy produced during photosynthesis. These tissues and new growth are rich in nutrients and tender and are often the frequent target of insects, disease, and animal. Uh, next. Apical meristem in the root tips extends the reach of the tree roots with longer roots and more root hairs in search of water and minerals. Secondary growth here thickens existing roots. Beyond the root tips and the twig tips, most of the tree trunk, branches, and roots are dead wood, all but a thin strip of actively dividing cells on the outer edge. Thin bands of regenerating meristem called vascular cambium produce this living layer. Cambium produces new wood on the inside and new bark on the outside. This new wood and bark is alive for a while, actively transporting minerals up and down the tree. The wood eventually dies, but continues to serve as a transportation route for years. When that function is eventually diminished, the wood serves as structural support. The new bark dies, but protects the tree for many years before it eventually is cast off. Each year, the cambium produces two distinct rings of tissue. In the spring, a layer of thinner wall springwood cells, which appear lighter in color, and a layer of late summer wood cells comprised of thicker walls and a darker color. 
When counting the edge of a tree using a tree cookie, be sure to count either light or dark, not both. Okay? So we've talked about how a tree gets bigger. Let's talk about how trees reproduce themselves. Trees, like all other green plants, have sexual reproductive structures responsible for the development of flowers, pollen, seed, and fruit. Seeds fall onto the forest floor and grow into seedlings. Many trees are also able to reproduce through regeneration from existing tissue. Several trees in Alaska have the ability to produce new growth from cut stumps Suckers off lateral roots called, uh, and, and suckers off lateral roots. Black spruce is able to regenerate new growth from low-hanging branches that come in contact with the forest soils, and most willows will sprout from broken off branches or cuttings. Next. But at some point, all trees began as a seed. Seeds come in many shapes and some in packages, such as spruce cones. From the seed sprouts a seedling that grows into a sapling and then a mature tree. After many years, the tree dies but continues to play a role in the forest as a snag or a standing dead tree, providing shelter and habitat for many forest occupants. Even after the tree falls over and begins rotting, it still plays a role in providing a rich and fertile nursery ground for the next seed to fall upon it. Okay? Winters provide a special challenge to the perennial stationary tree. Because trees can't get up to move to a more suitable location when colder and shorter days of winter arrive, it must either adapt to the changing seasons or die. Next. Deciduous trees change color as, tree, as green chlorophyll dies, revealing the presence of other colors of chlorophyll. The, the trees eventually drop their leaves for the winter months, reducing the need for water to travel up the tree during winter where it could freeze killing the tree. Dropping the leaves also reduces damage to the tree from snow loading. Tender bud tips are covered with thick and hard protective scales. Next. Conifers are evergreens also drop their needles or leaves, just not all at once often retaining their needles for two to three years. Keeping their needles through winter allows these trees to continue photosynthesis on the sunny, warm days that they do have, reducing the amount of energy reserves they must store, but it comes at a price which they've adapted to deal with. For starters, needles and other evergreen leaves have a thicker outer layer of cotton than their broad leaf cousins. More importantly, conifers have developed check valves of sorts within the trachea of their xylem. Because the tree relies on the cohesive properties of water to transport essential elements to the tree, it is important that the column of water running up through the xylem not break because of freezing. Xylem tracheid cells of conifers have adapted to be able to close at both ends, preventing the column of water from within from freezing and rupturing cell walls, killing the tree. Conifers have also developed a shape that more easily allows snow to slide off rather than pile up. Okay. And then we have a question from Abe. The question is, um, an example of a conifer that loses its needles. Ah, and Helen, and maybe. Helen yes, often called a uh, uh, larch, also 
Eastern larch is found in interior Alaska. Siberian larch is often planted in the Cook Inlet area throughout and survives well. Any other questions while I'm stopped? Go ahead and type them in if you have any, any more. Okay. So, um, oh, good. Even in deciduous trees, where water is not actively transported up the tree for photosynthesis, the tree remains full of water, and to avoid freezing, the tree must acclimate as temperatures decline. Acclimation is prompted by the changes in the photo period, which triggers physiological changes within the tree. This increases the permeability of cell membranes, allowing water to more easily pass through. As water now leaves the cell, solute concentrations within the cell walls increase, slightly lowering the internal freezing point. As temperatures drop, water outside the cells freezes first, generating small, uh, specific energy and small amounts of energy that help internal cell fluids remain unfrozen. This process effectively reduces the freezing point of cell water, avoiding killing temperatures. Um, do you want me to answer that question? I can answer Kay's questions now. Why is the tamarack adapted to be deciduous? Um, that would be great. I can't, other than it, it's probably more likely that it adapted from leaves to needles and uh, was always deciduous to begin with. Um, because it's not a conifer or an ever, it is, um, there comes a, a, there's a fine line or there's a little bit of um, la overlap when we refer to forest terms. Trees are most often categorized as either evergreen are deciduous. And in almost, almost every case, all evergreen trees are conifers and deciduous trees are hardwoods or broadleaves. There are exceptions to that, such as the tamarack, which is a conifer but also loses its leaves, which means its xylem tracheans are not adapted to the, um, if we went back one cell and I mentioned that the uh, trachea cells and uh, the trachea xylem cells in conifers have adapted a small closure within the cells so they can close off in cold temperatures preventing the freezing of the water. Although tamarack is a conifer, it is not an evergreen. It is not a gymnosperm, and therefore does not have that adaptation allowing it to seal off the trachea in the xylem. So, did that make, does that explanation make sense? Uh, if you want further explanation, if you could write uh, in the chat. Okay. So, um, I think I finished on this one. Uh, basically, the adaptations allow the cell temperatures to stay unfrozen. So, we have covered a lot of information, and um, we're getting close to question time. So, I'll get to this last question from Abraham um, after I finish up here. So, hold tight, Abraham. Um, I, I'm hoping that with an interest in the trees, you'll get your students out. Our forests offer many opportunities for learning, whether it's a small group of trees next to your school or a state or, a state or a national forest close by. Um, next. Springtime is a great time to get out and learn about the function of the trees by tapping into a few sugar trees. In Alaska, that would be our birch trees. Tapping trees is an excellent way to learn how xylem transports essential elements and stored energy reserves to the branch tips with the rising sap. Measuring trees and calculating volume is an excellent applied math lesson and done over time can illustrate how trees and plants grow during the season and over time.
Next. For those of you that have taken a project learning tree training and have the materials, here's a short list of activities that would all reinforce the concepts that we went over today. And while it's not an exhaustive list, it would certainly get you started. Next. PLT also has a few secondary modules that would reinforce these concepts with your older students. Both Focus on the Forest and Places We Live offer forest assessment activities and worksheets for diving deeper into the forest functions. Next. Shorter versions of many of these activities are available on the Project Learning Tree website at this address. Nature Activities for Families offers a variety of short activities you can do with your students throughout the school year, in your classroom, in the schoolyard, or on field trips. Next. I'd uh, like to encourage you also to check out the Project Learning Tree website for more um, activities and educator resources the blog and uh, the teacher blog and a few other, other titles under the resource can be really helpful. Uh, next. And then I've also pulled together a lot of the resources I used in today's presentation and hopefully those will help you explore a little more on the topics. And then that's it. Uh, next, Kathy, contact. So I was reading Abraham's, um, give me a minute, let me read the question before I take a chance to respond, and I guess now would be the time for question answers. That's right, Meg, go right ahead. Okay, so I'm looking at Abraham's. Um, Abraham, are you referring to when I was talking about conifers and um, evergreens versus deciduous and broadleaf? That's about the time your question came up. So if you could expand on it a little more then. Okay. I, I think that what Kay has offered, the dichotomous key, would help you. Okay. Conifers, deciduous, spruce, pines, evergreen, they seem to overlap in my mind. They do overlap in your mind. And um, so conifers and deciduous are classifications of trees. Spruces, pines are species of trees. Evergreens is a, is a classification. Using a dichotomous key will help you not only identify trees, it will reinforce the divisions between gymnosperms, which are the broad classes, and uh, angiosperms. So um, Kay also commented that Abe lives in Kodiak and he knows Sitka spruces and alders, which are broad leaves. So I would direct you again to the dichotomous key um, and look at the literature. Uh, I don't have the flexibility, uh, Abraham, of pulling up a new diagram to show that to you. Uh, so I'd also say that you are free to contact me afterwards and I can point you to some more specific resources to get to your question. Um, are there other questions out there? Go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get them answered. Ross had put in a question that went back a while and I'll read his question for you. Um, the tamarack got me thinking about it. Does living, does live staking work with evergreens? Uh, Ross, I'm going to assume you're talking about regeneration and um, talking about cutting. Is that correct? So, yeah, 
Russ responded that, uh, yes, he was referring to something like a cutting. In general, evergreens do not regenerate by cuttings. The fact that a black spruce is able to regenerate through the process called layering that I described before where low-lying branches that come into contact with forest soil are able to develop a root system is really rare. So the general answer is no, evergreens do not regenerate that way. However, in most forestry, like most biology, there are exceptions and you will find a few of those. Um, okay, Janet had made the point that a few of the people online live in remote areas that may not have trees close by. Um, and that can be challenging too in order to get these uh, concepts embedded. There's not a lot that you can go out and, and do. Um, however, even tundra species have many of the characteristics of a woody tree. You may find a resin birch up there, which is an understory in the boreal forest, but you may find it in tundra areas. Um, it is a broadleaf um, perennial plant, as are some other small shrubs that you can find on the slope. Um, I'm not sure that evergreens unless there were black spruce that you could find in your areas. Unfortunately, if you don't have trees close by, the internet's probably your best resource for finding examples. And uh, we do have, PLT does offer uh, a couple of leaf sample kits that can be checked out. You can contact me by this email address. There's uh, kits in the Palmer Fossil area I can mail out. And then we have resources in the Fairbanks area. Shannon, okay. Shannon, did you Shannon have a has a question. I will. <laughs> Go ahead, Shannon. Unmute your phone. Oh, sorry, I just typed in the chat box, but basically I'm wondering, when you're counting uh, tree rings, do you include the heartwood? I'm assuming probably not, but as an extra year. So what you will see, Shannon, when you look at a tree cookie is a, a series of concentric circles. And you do count them all the way down until you can't count any further. So technically, anything beyond that first layer of xylem on the on either on one on that inside of the cambium is heartwood. So yes, you are counting heartwood all the way down to the center circle. Some areas um, will, and some foresters will suggest that then once you count all the circles, you can see then you add on uh, five years. For the tr for when the tree was smaller, that's kind of regional, and generally we'll just stop with saying counting it down as far as you can see. Hey, um, uh, it's uh, Kate has pointed out that she often uses YouTube videos for folks that don't um, live in treed areas. Uh, that's a good suggestion. Um, being old and not very technology savvy, sometimes I forget those resources. But there are some excellent uh, resources. Uh, some of the things that I've sent for you also have some good information on identifying trees. Um, I wanted to look at. Oh. I think Kay had a question on chat. Oh, uh, who did? Kay, let me read it. Would you, Nick, would you address the dark rings versus lighter ones in seasonal growth, please? OK. Um, each year, the xylem produces two layers of cells. When it first starts producing in the spring, growth is fast and furious. And the cells that are produced are much thinner walled, and they appear a light 
color. As the season progresses, the cell growth slows down and the walls to the cells of the xylem get thicker. This gives the, the what we call then summer wood a darker color. So you have a lighter color in the spring and a darker color in the late summer or fall. And the colors reflect the growth of the tree based on seasonality. Is that, uh, did that answer your question? Thank you. Perfect, she says. I'd like to pause for a second and see if Emily, who is just on the phone, has any questions. Emily? Uh, nope, all of mine have been answered. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for Meg, anyone? Well, hearing none, we'll move on to our last slide. And first, I would like to um, thank all of you for joining us today. As um, uh, I just want to explain that there were several, four in fact, um, in Varathon students, Helen, Shannon, Emily, and Abe, um, who are working with K Shoemaker. Um, gearing up for the Envirathon, which will occur here in Alaska in April. In addition, um, of course, we've, we've got uh, uh, several educators online. And um, uh, when we complete this section, those of you who are taking uh, the course, um, please stay online for just a couple minutes. But mostly, I'd like to thank um, Meg Burgett um, for presenting um, a whole lot of great information today. And I'd also like to once again um, thank those organizations whose logos you see on the screen for Kathy? making this webinar series possible. Kathy? Um, yeah. We had a question that I didn't get to. Um, it's, uh, the question was that Abe asked the difference between alders and willows. Um, well, alders and willows are two different species. So uh, let me give a quick response. It's going to be hard without any visuals, but alder and willows are two different species. They're often found in similar locations, and um, you, so you often find them side by side. In general, an alder leaf will be broader and, uh, and significantly serrated on the edges, which means the edges of the leaf will be real sharply pointed. The leaves are usually uh, very shiny, and the veins along the leaf are very prominent. Willows, on the other hand, are very narrowly serrated, so they, while they do have teeth on some of the leaves, the teeth are very small, and you need to look closely to see them. Willow leaves are almost always longer than they are wide. Willow leaves are often I uh, have, often have a gray or soft underside to the leaf, um, giving the leaf kind of a fuzzy feel on the, on the back side. Um, alders will produce cones uh, as part of their sexual reproductive structure. Willows produce kekins. Did that uh, give you enough to go on, Abe? Uh, and so Abe had a follow-up question. Um, Kay specified in her response that uh, riparian areas, I said that you find them in similar regions. Um, and he asked, how about winter when they have no leaves? How can you tell them apart? There are characteristics. Well, let me back up and say, for one thing, telling willow from willow can be really challenging, and definitely not in the winter. Telling willow from alders, your clues are looking at the bud structure. And in a previous comment on the chat, um, Kay mentioned dichotomous key, which is a tool that we use for identifying plants. Dichotomous keys are they come either at looking at uh, leaves or at buds and twigs. 
So you use the same type of system to identify trees in the wintertime. You would just use tree shape and bud structure for identification. And Janet just threw up a resource for you. Sorry to interrupt you, Kathy. Nope, go right ahead. And I think he's covered. All right, let me pause again and see if there are any other questions. And Kay also pointed out that in Kodiak, where Abraham is from, they have red alders, which is different from the alder shrubs that we see more commonly in South Central Cook Inlet region. Um, the difference being between shrub and tree. Trees are identified generally as having a single stem. If you refer back to the definition I gave earlier, sometimes tree, uh, trees are, will have multiple stems and still fit the definition of tree. But generally, multiple stems indicate a shrub. Shrubs are shorter and um, they branch from the ground. So uh, red alder is considered a tree. In fact, red alder is an important lumber species in southeast Alaska. So it grows into sizes to make it useful enough to cut into lumber. So it would have a single stem straight bowl. Thank you, Meg. Other questions out there? Okay, well, um, I should mention that um, all of you should have been sent the PDF file of this presentation, and the links in that file should be hot linked so that if you want to take some of those links for resources that Meg put in her last couple of slides, uh, you should be able to do so um, through the PDF. Um, two weeks from today, on February 18th, so let me back up. Thank you again, Meg, very much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, two weeks from today, on February 18th at 4 o'clock um, again, we will have the next installment of this webinar series. It will be presented by Sierra Doherty from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And the topic will be wildlife. With that, um, I will sign off. And I wish you a good evening. Thanks for joining us. Um, quick response to Russ. Uh, yes, all seminars will run for about an hour. And if you're taking it for credit, hang on for future further instruction. Right. Thank you, Nick. Kathy, do you have the names of those that were um, that signed up for credit? Yes, um, Todd Hunter is uh, online, and